Hello? Good afternoon. It's uh, it's uh, it, and welcome to our uh, sixth webinar uh, uh, webinar series. We are trying to we are trying to uh, to to repair a, a, a small technical problem. So I hope everything was fine. I would like to start uh, and thanking you all because I know we had a, a lot of viewers from all over the world, and I know some of you watch it quite early in the morning. Uh, the project uh, of CIS webinars is going forward. We are we have had the chance to see a lot of topics. We will uh, look at new ones. Uh, we will discuss it uh, in the next weeks. But looking at other sports and other reality, uh, what we are uh, willing to do, and we will remember you again as as uh, always. Uh, is, is to have an approach which makes uh, combining, uh, giving you new information, showing us what we're trying to do in the research and what our alumni and our staff is doing. Today, we are talking about a very odd point in, in, in the question of uh, sports during the crisis, and that's a question of the transfer system. And, uh, who is winning from this situation, who is losing most. We are asking four guest speakers today uh, to talk about, uh, uh, about the issue. So football transfer during the pandemic is a hot element. So we won't get into detail about 
cases of, of transfers, what we will look at is trying to understand what's happening generally in the, in, in, in the topic. So I will uh, introduce you our four panelists, uh, st starting with Denis Subasic, who is the uh, CEO of Lokomotiv Zagreb. Lokomotiv Zagreb is a typical <laughs> uh, old uh, uh, Croatian club. Uh, hi, Den Denis, how are you? I'm good, and uh, welcome to all the guests and yourself and uh, our fellow participants. Yes. Uh, what What is the situation at the moment for the club? Well, for the situation at the moment is we're not playing matches, obviously. Uh, the league is re re uh, due to resume in uh, early June. And uh, we've uh, resumed training as normal, collective training as of uh, Monday. So, so slowly the situation in Croatia is we're getting back to normal. Perfect. Uh, second uh, speaker uh, will be uh, one of our uh, CIS staff who is working uh, with us for many years and has, has been a guest lecturer at the FIFA Master for years and has been a guest lecturer for the network as well. Well, uh, he created quite a lot of years ago now, even if he's still very young, uh, the football observatory that became a, a, one of the key element of, of CIS. I would like to introduce you to Raffaele Poli. Raffaele is himself a former player. He played in so many clubs in Tessin so that I didn't find a book about one of this club, Mendrisio or others. I decided to put a book on football in Tessin. Hello, Raf. Uh, I hope uh, you're fine. Uh, what's the situation uh, in the, in, at the moment in the observatory? Can you continue to do some work? Yeah, hi Pierre, hi everybody. We are still doing a lot of studies. It's a good period, I think, to uh, to reinforce our approach. We have a lot of visibility because, uh, of course, uh, the media do not have matches uh, to speak about, so they look for more deeper analysis. And I think is a is a good way of fulfilling our role at the CS Football Observatory to to uh, to present some innovative analysis and. Uh, among others around the, the, the transfers, even though, of course, uh, we won't experience a lot of transfers, or not uh, now, but even probably in the next summer, but still uh, we are we are trying to uh, to apply our approach a bit, uh, also looking at what happened in the past and to have uh, perhaps uh, more than in usual times uh, a deeper approach and uh, an historic one. Yeah, it's always good to have some time to reflect on what's happening and definitely from this point of view it's it's an interesting it's an interesting time uh, our next speaker is Piotr Sadowski a former FIFA master student uh, from Poland but Piotr is a is, is, is a scout for Manchester United uh, hello Piotr how are you hello Pierre. thank you I'm very well hello everyone so you're in Poland at the moment, are you? Yeah, I'm at the moment uh, in Poland with my family, but uh, I can say that I'm working from home, <laughs> doing video, video scouting. Okay, so you will tell us what is video scouting at the moment? How, how does it work? <laughs> yeah, you just simply just watching, you? watching yes. games on on video and just analyzing players and games. Okay. Uh, our last panelist is Franco Costanzo, who is a, uh, with, who is a former international goalkeeper, played in many countries, including uh, Switzerland, Chile, uh, Greece, and uh, his home country of Argentina. He, he started as, as at, at River Plate and, uh, and uh, uh, is now one of the uh, ed, ed, uh, responsible for the, for the transfers uh, for FC Basel in Switzerland. Uh, particularly looking at the South American market. Franco, how are you? Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. And yes, uh, a tough situation at the moment. But well, hopefully this is going to end as soon as possible. Good. So our, our first question uh, is regarding uh, the reality of the, of the well, of the transfer for the players uh, in this complicated period, how do you, how do you deal? I would I would like to start with Dennis and with with the vision of the 
of the CEO of a club. How do you deal with the players uh, in this complicated period about discussing about, uh, you know, length of contracts, uh, how, the, how the salaries should, should, should arrive, how the, and, and with the potential groups, how does it work at the moment? Probably you, you had no experience of, of, of comparable yeah. situation in the past. Yeah, I mean, uh, our communication obviously during the crisis had to be a little bit more intense. You know, we always communicate with the players. The players understand our position as a club. They understand our budget budgeting limitations. They also understand that uh, together we, we all have to make some some uh, smaller sacrifices for the, uh, the long term. And, uh, you know, we, we've managed to discuss all the uh, crisis related elements uh, with the players in, in a you know, really good atmosphere, and uh, they've been very appreciative and understanding of, uh, of the situation. Um, you know, our, our club is not a big club. We don't have a big budget. So we, we, there's, a, there's certain lim limitations as to how much we can actually ask the players to sacrifice. So uh, just to give you an idea, the average wages of, of players at our club are between, say, five or 7,000 euros. So, uh, you know, we have a, a certain limit how, how much we can actually ask the players to sacrifice. But, uh, you know, uh, getting straight to the topic, uh, because the topic, and just as an introduction, I would like to say that, um, you know, to give you an idea of, of uh, Croatian league or Croatian clubs and how much we depend on, on, on transfer revenue, um, we have an extremely high uh, uh, reliance on uh, transfer related revenue and in, and in actual fact i would rather call it football activity related revenue and when i say football activity related revenue i refer to uh transfer revenue uh specific team related uh, uh, revenue that is generated by the cup club playing U uefa club competitions and also solidarity and training compensation that we we receive from former clubs as a result of them signing new contracts or being transferred. So all our activities, about almost 80%, comes from football-related activ activities. So it's very volatile. Um, and uh, regardless of the fact that this source of revenue is very volatile, uh, it's, it remains that this, this source of revenue has been relatively stable for, for uh, Croatian clubs for the last 15 years. Uh, it, it's strange, but uh, the inescapable truth for, for Croatian clubs is that we are actually addicted addicted to UEFA revenue and transfer revenue. Mm -hmm. Did uh, okay it, before going to my to my colleagues, did the the, the 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 demand of the players change since since it started or did did you see a I, I think there's a lot of uncertainty because we we uh, you know the strategy we chose to, to rely on transfer revenues, it's not because we we, we cho choose this uh, tra strategy. It comes because we because the, our country is is a little bit economically underdeveloped. So, for example, Premier League revenues amount to ten percent of, of of more than ten percent of Croatia's national GDP. So, it, not having TV rights revenue, uh, you know, you have to understand in Croatia clubs receive one hundred and fifty thousand euros per year. For, from TV revenues, so we're forced to find an alternative source, and and a result of this deficiency in the economic area of, our, of the way clubs are run, um, we've replaced these revenues with with uh, transfer revenues, and now we're waiting to see what's going to happen, you know, in, in in Europe, because you know obviously we think if clubs in the big leagues are not going to have TV rights and they're not going to play football, they're not going to want to buy players, they're not want, want, wanting to acquire the services of players. So this is where there's a lot of uncertainty. It's very difficult to put, uh, to, to really locate when and when, when or if the situation will uh, will go come back to normal. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, contracts of player are, as you just early said, a very volatile element. Uh, how do you deal, uh, Franco, with this volatile element uh, from uh, from your perspective? Because your your case is a very interesting one. You work for the European club, but the market you are more involved in is the South American one. How do, how do both markets understand this reality at this moment? Uh, I think it's just uh, Dennis explaining in a really good way. 
uh, everybody at the moment is waiting and see what happens. You know, most of them, they are just starting to, to prepare and to, to train again. So nobody's talking about, at the moment, about who is buying or who is selling uh, contracts of players. So uh, at the moment, it's really an uncertain time to, to, to say or to evaluate something. But we will see. Uh, a lot of changes are coming. Uh, and in South America, uh, it's even more complicated than here in, in Europe because of the economic uh, situation. It's really, really uncertain as well. So I think big changes are coming. But right now, I think nobody can say what is going to happen. Big crisis of 2001 and 2002. One of the best sellers in, in books was called Irse, going out and leaving the country, which was really the number one strategy for everybody, but more than anyone for footballers. Do you have the impression this may happen about the same way currently uh, in countries like, like yours in, in, in Argentina? So I think uh, during this period of crisis, it's uh, a lot of opportunities as well. So most of the players uh, in South America wants to make the step and come and play in a bigger league in, in Europe. So uh, there will be always uh, opportunities. And I think uh, when these uh, waters come down a little bit, Uh, we will uh, have to, 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 to distribute again the, the cards and see what happens. Exactly, yes. Uh, Piotr, uh, tell me, the, the European market for British clubs, still the, the kind of, of understanding that um, moving is, is the key issues for the young players and, and, and the recruitment is the key issues for the main clubs? I think um, the situation is uh, pretty tough at the moment, and as uh, Franco or Dennis said, we don't know what will be in the in the future. Uh, but uh, and we can say it's a, it's a crisis, but we can't only say it's a bad thing. We have to always say that crisis is an opportunity, opportunity to rethink, or or opportunity to reshape, and opportunity to change. Um, so and. Um, Personally, I think that uh, strong clubs, I mean, club, clubs with uh, strong financial background and clubs with uh, strong squad will be winners of the situation, but also clubs with uh, academy-based model. Uh, it means that uh, such things like scouting and recruitment is, is still very important because you have to have your database Uh, on the players and you have to know what's going on in the market you can't you can't give up with this you have to always uh, follow the last trends and you have to know what's going on and uh, the other thing is that um, actually the transfer market will not disappear but prices might be lower there will be probably less money in the market so but anyway you have to always build your squad you have to strengthen your squad Therefore, you need to uh, know what players you can you can get, and uh, such things like scouting, recruitment are always important and even more important at the moment. Yeah, there was a question to yourself and to Dennis from uh, Yaroslav uh, Kanievsky uh, on on YouTube. Uh, how do you protect? How, how do you protect uh, countries like Poland and Croatia from too low transfer value to rich countries? Should those countries be afraid? of two intense drainage? And which of the two would like to start? Well, maybe I can, I can say a few words. I think, I think the current situation, um, it, 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 I think we all need to take a serious look at, as to how clubs are managed. You know, protecting clubs from talent drainage uh, depends on governing bodies as well and how they're going to address uh, the issues that are going to come up in the next period. Um, 
you know, in the in the wake in the wake of difficulties that football has faced, not only because of the coronavirus, but even previously, um, you know, governing bodies need to preserve this ecosystem because it's not only about the bigger clubs; it's also about preserving the smaller clubs. Um, you know, uh, I think the coming period is going to be very interesting to see how uh, governing bodies, clubs, and and leagues are going to address issues that relate to governance. Uh, to uh, enhance the principle of solidarity, to improve competitive balance. These issues have been around for, for a long time, not only related to, to coronavirus. And, and I think it's very important that there is that, that, that some model uh, which will provide some form of sustainability for clubs regardless of their size, especially clubs belong, belonging to the lower echelon, echelon of clubs in the, in the European club football structure. Yes, uh, from your, I, I don't know, Piotr, if you have any, any point to add or? Yeah, just uh, I would like to say that I'm not going to talk about Poland, but uh, talking about the whole Central, Central Eastern Europe, I can say, um, I don't think we should uh, talking about uh, protecting uh, these countries from too low uh, transfer values. I think it can even be an opportunity for those clubs because um, Players from uh, Central Eastern Europe, from let's say Poland, Czech Republic, from Slovakia, uh, are of are, are cheaper, are lo of lower value than uh, players from Spain, Portugal, or, or, or France. So I think there still is a chance for these clubs from Central from Central Eastern Europe uh, to to transfer players and to, to to get money out of this situation. Yes. Uh, From your Raffaele, from your from your academic office uh, at CIS, yes, in a fantastic uh, castle in the center of Neuchâtel, how do you how do you see the whole situation evolving? How do you how do you see the the general spectrum at this moment? I think there will be uh, less uh, transfers in volume. That's for sure, because. Uh, Uh, even because of the schedule of matches, we don't know when uh, the leagues will restart or those who are restarting, is, uh, there is even a doubt about uh, the possibility of stopping again. So this, of course, uh, prevent clubs from planning and uh, uh, without planning it's very difficult to, to change players, of course. But at the same time, uh, the price for the same player will probably go down, but uh, This is not. Uh, this would be a really new trend because uh, this price is uh, doubled for the last five years. The same players now cost five uh, double the price than five years ago, and uh, this is an incredible inflation, even bigger inflation than the budget of clubs. So we have seen a bit, uh, a lot of speculation, probably too much on the transfer of players, on transferring players, young players to have profits. And as Danny said, many clubs and perhaps too many are reliant on the, the ability to, uh, to have profits on the transfer market, not only to, uh, to have money, to spare money, to have money in the reserve, uh, which, which could be a good thing, but still even to, to leave, to, to be able to finish the season. So, of course, I think uh, what we will see is uh, now uh, clubs going bankruptcy, probably, because uh, they perhaps will not receive the money uh, for the transfer and don't, not even speak about the new transfer, which probably won't uh, happen, but also for the past transfer, because uh, as you know, clubs do not pay the full sum uh, immediately. Uh, up front, so there are still uh, there is still money to be paid for the the transfer which occurred uh, six months, one year, even two years ago, and uh, I'm not sure that all clubs will be able to pay. Uh, on another level, as Piotr said, I think that the big clubs will be able. They have the liquidity. They will respect what they have to pay. Uh, probably they won't buy the spend that much now than in the past, uh, there will be a deflation even for them. But there was a very interesting uh, news uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago about the takeover of uh, Manchester City of a second division Belgian club, Lommel. I don't know if yeah. you 
know that. And I think is that even the timing is very interesting because during the COVID, in the middle of the COVID, they uh, they announced it, and uh, it's not the first club they take over. Is uh, they even um, there are rumors about uh, Nancy in France, so they keep going these big clubs to uh, to monopolizing a bit the market and uh, having a greater control on more play on more clubs, and by the way, more players. So this is, I think, quite symptomatic of the situation with the middle sized small club a bit uh, stuck, blocked uh, by the situation. And the bigger one that could, uh, perhaps not now, but at least uh, earlier, uh, find a way to restart business as usual and take advantage uh, in the end of the situation. Good. Uh, one, one question before we continue from, uh, from Marc Dubois on, uh, on YouTube uh, to Franco. Hi, Franco. Uh, how does the great loss of international value of the Argentinian peso uh, impact or affect the economic state of the club there? Yeah, well, this is a good question because, like I've just said, uh, Argentina is... Uh, the crisis is not only a corona crisis, it's about the economic crisis as well. At the moment, we have a... a like a 60 percent increase of the of a, sorry i don't i can remember the word is the um, well uh, we have a 60 percent of increase of the the value of the the peso against the dollar so uh, the clubs are really really in a deep crisis at the moment and so like i just said in this time of crisis, there they are a lot of opportunities as well. So uh, clubs are forced to sell players at the moment to to keep their uh, balances uh, on the blue zone. So, uh, but uh, at the moment, uh, nobody knows who's uh, when is going to start the league, when they are going to return to training as a normal way, and so. Uh, I, I, I really can't, I'm not uh, uh, prepared to say what is going to happen because <laughs> and, and we don't so want you clear. we don't want you to, to say what will happen. It's not the objective. It's just no, to, no, no, it's just to give an idea about the present. Yeah. yeah, the inflation is huge. Uh, this is the word I, I didn't remember uh, just now. So the inflation in Argentina is the, the main thing. So clubs has are struggling to pay their own contracts. Uh, so uh, they, they, they compromise with a huge amount of money. Uh, I'm talking about big clubs like Regal Play, Boca Juniors. They, they are paying huge contracts. And now uh, they will have to make a reduction uh, because it's impossible to pay it now. So, yeah. If I, if I compare with it, 2001 2002 crisis the, the two big clubs in particular river and boca um, took benefit of the crisis because they were buying contract in pesos and selling contract of players in dollars at that time there there the gap between them and the rest of the club were not able really to uh, to make big deals with international clubs had to, to, to continue to do deals in pesos and not in dollars made a huge difference. They were yeah. the major yeah, you're right. international you're right. contracts were made by the two bigs, while the other yeah. were really at a low level. You're right. You're right. But at that moment, the crisis was only in Argentina. And all the clubs of the world, they really have money and they can't spend it. So now <laughs> we will have to see what happened with the, with the players uh, and the games. So who's going to have the money or who's going to make the first step to to start buying players but okay buying players contract players contract sorry you're right <laughs> yes <laughs> thanks franco you, you you don't forget my class uh, <laughs> next question by david squires a former fifa master student assuming the pandemic will result in a reduction in volume and value of transfers in the summer how severe will this be in comparison to previous years I think, to, to, to yeah, I can, I can say something, so maybe someone will follow me. 
Um, I think uh, I don't I don't know at the moment how big will be the difference, but uh, it, for sure there will be a difference. But I think personally, I think that. Uh, clubs, uh, especially in uh, Central Eastern Europe, uh, will be more happy to loan players than uh, doing uh, permanent transfers, because loaning a player is uh, less expensive than uh, than buying a contract of the player. And uh, also there is also, that there will be also an opportunity for academic graduates. Uh, clubs will be more happy than they had, than, than they were before to promote their, their academy players. So it's a big chance for, for young, talented uh, players to get into professional football even quicker than they were expected. And also for these clubs from Central Eastern Europe is a big chance to, to develop and to promote these players by giving them chance to play in the first uh, 11 in the, in the professional league. Yeah, I think uh, the, the best example we saw was the case of uh, the the uh, the observatory made it in the in the past month, but before the crisis. But it was clear with what happened to Chelsea, who was obliged exactly. by UEFA not to contact or to contract any players for a while. So they used a lot the academy. Exactly. That may be maybe what, what will, will happen. I follow you. Exactly. Completely. And by doing this, now we know uh, such names like uh, Tammy Abraham and Mason Mount very well. So, so <laughs> it was a, you know, it was a big chance, a big opportunity for these players to, to develop and to get into professional football. Yes. Uh, if I did that. If I could just add a little bit, um, uh, I, I want to again refer to, to measures which could be possibly taken to preserve, uh, you know, the, the resources, the financial resources that clubs have. Um, the, the, some of these issues have been around for a long time. You know, if, if we consider that in the last 15 years, agents have earned, uh, you know, four or five times more than, than clubs who have developed players, then uh, we can see how important it's going to be in the coming period uh, for FIFA to introduce, for example, the, 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 the new agent regulations. Um, you know, if, if 400 million in the last 15 years has gone to, 400 million dollars has gone to clubs who have trained players and 1.7 billion dollars has gone to agents, there is something wrong, you know, with, with this system. And uh, that's why the new uh, uh, regulations uh, they need to be introduced before the upcoming transfer window to prevent the first further extraction of valuable resources, you know, for, for, from clubs. We, we have a fantastic opportunity to clean up some issues which have been in football for a long time. Yes, abs abs I, I, I completely agree with you. I think that's the moment to re-see the logic of the, of the position of the agents. Uh, intermediary in, 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 in the market. Uh, next question, we have a lot and Please do not hesitate if you have some comments to make to your colleagues. Uh, next question from Jack Cairns on YouTube. What trends within the transfer market do the panelists think will become apparent post-virus? For example, more prudent recruitment, player swap, loan deals, as, uh, as uh, Piotr was saying, free agent influx. Well, so what do you see as uh, the main new trend? That's what I said about the, the trend of loaning the players. But also, I would add one thing. Um, instead of uh, buying contracts of new players, uh, clubs will be interested in extending contracts of current players from their squads. So this will be the trend, I think. So that's that's important thing to, to emphasize. Great. Raffaele, I think you had... The trend which is... Uh ongoing uh, since a while uh, as the clubs those who really need the money from transfer and these are the majority of clubs worldwide uh, if, the, if they cannot transfer they are in struggle even to extend the contract because the players perhaps want to move or so they will accept more easily loans to bigger clubs or uh, they will perhaps uh, accept less money in exchange perhaps uh, of a higher percentage of uh, sell-on fees uh, or uh, conditional payments in case of uh, good performance. We have seen this trend in player salary where the fixed uh, 
part of the salary decreases uh, to the, the advantage of a conditional part according to the performances. Uh, and the same, I think, will happen is happening in transfer because, uh, of course, the clubs who must uh, transfer the players need this money, so they they want the player to move, the players want to move. But uh, from uh, the, the buying a club point of view, uh, there is uh, the, uh, the, the possibility to reduce the risk by such, so paying perhaps let's uh, less money in front uh, and also uh, rescheduling the payments, which is problematic also because now we see even operation when the first payment occurs uh, not only after one year, but after two years with two, two years of loan and then uh, uh, the payment afterwards and perhaps uh, uh, the play the club as i said don't uh, even has the money now to pay but is a very speculative approach and perhaps sometimes they will re-transfer the player because even uh, paying him uh, the first installments so uh, uh, this i think is a bit uh, the, the, the 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 situation and it will uh, uh, yeah. it will be reinforced after uh, with this uh, pandemic we have a, a lot of other questions i will, I will see one in, in, in one second but i believe another actor that we will not have to forget are the states and the leagues and the and the national associations because if we compare other industries that are struggling at the moment let's say car industry uh, tourism industry uh, air, airplanes and airports the state is putting money in, into it and the, the money put by the state may oblige the clubs and the, and the various parties to have a different behavior in the future. Are such scenarios thinkable in, in current football? Yeah, the difference is, I think, between, uh, uh, you know, in the other industries, they have some representation with, with, uh, with uh, you know, with governance and whatever they're lobbying for, 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 for their interests. You know, uh, when I refer to, and if we talk in today's discussion, we can see how diverse the football club football landscape is. Because even in today's discussions, we've got somebody from Manchester United, so they obviously rely very heavily on TV rights. That we have somebody from Basel in Switzerland. I think the clubs rely a lot on sponsorship and ticket uh, revenues. I have myself from Croatia. We rely a lot of, on, on, on transfer revenue and player development revenue. So we can see for even from today's, from today's discussion how diverse the club landscape is. And uh, when we talk about representation, I think it's very important that smaller clubs find some way of having a better representation within you know, governing bodies. Because you know, in big corporations, they have, uh, you know, they have chambers of commerce while smaller uh, uh, industry uh, segments have SNEs, you know, that they are all uh, involved. Whereas in our case, I, I, would, I would say probably uh, uh, separate a little bit the, the, the middle and, and smaller clubs. We don't have any representation at the moment. Yeah, we, we, had, we had a lot of questions from Mateusz Stasiak, for example, who says, you know, let's see with, with the current rules, do you think that do you think that the financial fair play will be more stringent? Uh, should should the, the, the clubs only be able to finalize transfers of, of players while they are sure that both parties are able to fulfill the, the terms of the agreement? Uh, what, what, what kind of uh, trends are possible on this from this point of view? Uh, and, and we can see, for example, the concept of salary cap as well can be one of the one very much debated in the case of Italy major discussion the, to create a salary cup now uh, as a solution to the crisis um, anyone want to start Piotr. financial stability have always been important for for football clubs and uh, uh, having good financial background it's very important because it's a part of the strategy i would say so uh, if you have a financial stability, you can think about your future. You can think about uh, developing your academy, about developing your scouting and recruitment and uh, developing your club on the commercial side. Uh, so that's very important. Um, it's up to UEFA to be more strong in terms of financial fair play. Um, I don't know if it can help, but uh, I would say that UEFA financial fair play is uh, already quite strict. 
Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you mentioned about the salary cap, and uh, I think this is the tool that would really help uh, uh, all all European clubs, uh, also in uh, strong leagues and in uh, smaller leagues like in Central Eastern uh, Europe, because uh, it will give the clubs the the tool that they can be like financially financially protected. It means that uh, football players and agents will not will not be that demanding as they used to be in the past so that's very important thing and quite a good idea to implement this uh, tool into into football Raffaele, so you had just to insist on what danny said before on the the the, the necessity to uh, to have a more uh, more solidarity in football i think because uh, of course the salary cap could be a good solution because we all want more equal competition a better competitive balance more clubs being able to um, perhaps not win the trophies but at least to fight for it uh, now the the leagues are quite boring some of them they you know already the winner before uh, they start so this is not good and uh, the salary cap could uh, rebalance a bit the forces and a way of achieving this objective would it also be to redistribute the money in a better way because of course now the money is very concentrated in the in the top clubs and uh, uh, with the reforms of the Champions League, etc., these uh, will be even reinforced. And the big clubs have the financial and political power now to uh, dictate a bit uh, the reforms also to UEFA and FIFA. So, uh, in the end, there is a, a power balance uh, uh, to be discussed. And uh, I think it is in the interest of everybody, even the big clubs, to have a, a, a more equality. Of course, uh, we are not speaking about full uh, equality between all the clubs. It never existed. But uh, the trend in the last, uh, let's say, uh, after the Bosman ruling uh, and the, the, the European Cup competitions reform uh, in the uh, end of the 90s is clearly too much orientated towards uh, the, 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 the riches, towards uh, those who have uh, uh, the fan base, the, the bigger fan base, and it is a vicious circle because uh, they reinforce every time and every year is more difficult for the rest of the clubs. That, that's why I was asking about the potential impact of the nation state and governments to, 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 to rebalance a little bit. They have a certain power that we saw in the crisis was important. Let's move to the next question because there are so many and, and, and we, are, we don't have too much time. Uh, Emil Edisonov uh, asks, how, how can club deal with transfer periods starting and ending on different dates? The question of the calendar is, is becoming, with the crisis, uh, uh, an essential one. This year more than ever. Some leagues resume, resume a month before others. Transfer windows for entire, entire countries may be lost. So tell us. So I would start with the, the with Franco and, uh, and and Piotr. We are dealing with this, these windows of calendar. How do you deal with that with this crisis? Yeah, uh, at the moment uh, we are trying to to organize ourselves and saying, okay, uh, what is going to happen in terms of selling, in terms of uh, necessities, or uh, so. We are organizing our schedule also to, to continue uh, watching the players we are interested in. So, but uh, like I, I said, you know, in, in, in South America, uh, I'm talking about South America because it is the, the market I'm, I'm moving. Uh, there are many, many countries, they, they still don't know when they are going to return to, to training. So, and from there, there are many changes also uh, in the leagues. For example, Argentina, they just said that they are not going to be teams relegated in this season. So that changed completely uh, the, 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 the structure and the, the game. So nobody's fighting for relegation. So clubs, they are, they are just... That's a very good point. The content yeah. of the matches, the way you play is different, yes? Yeah, exactly. So uh, there are big trouble there also for uh, for the for the players because most of the clubs are saying, okay, we are just reducing our our squad 
because we are not fighting for relegation. So there you have a big problem also with the players because uh, the contracts with this, uh, the, 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 the players who are uh, winning the most, they are saying, okay, uh, nobody's going to make a contract with us anymore because we are not fighting for anything. So it's that the moment is really, really unclear and it's not uh, sure how it's going on. So there are many changes in, in different leagues in different parts of the world. In South America, it's a bit complicated. Mm. Uh, yeah, the current situation is tough for, for clubs and they don't really know what they can expect uh, in the future. Um, the most important problem at the moment is the financial stability and uh, it's difficult for clubs to, to plan transfer budgets and also uh, the transfer window is in in the in the time frames uh, so it's uh, it can be another difficulty for for those clubs so um i think that uh, there are talks on the on the market between people unofficial talks that the current uh, not current just the summer transfer window should be extended and i think it's quite a good idea to extend uh, summer transfer window and even this would be a good idea to make a like a six months transfer window uh, from summer till winter to uh, 2021 and it would uh, give all those clubs the chance to to to, to better plan uh, transfers and uh, their budgets uh, because we need time to 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 get the situation clear so i think uh extending the transfer window is one of the ideas and it's, it's a good idea but the question is how long the uh, next transfer window should be great uh, next oh, question uh, from a former I, I yes dennis one one minute yes okay no problem oh, just one minute yeah I, I just want to refer to rafael's comments you know because uh, you know, the, the European competitions, they really have, and the governing bodies, they have an obligation to look after this aspect of solidarity because you have 130 million going to 600 clubs and you have, you know, 1.2 billion going to 20 clubs. You know, so, so Manchester City, for example, earns uh, by themselves the same amount that is being distributed to, to, to four, four or 500 clubs. This is, this is not a good situation. I think, I think UEFA or governing bodies have an opportunity to maybe rectify the situation, at least uh, in view of the current crisis, because even the smallest adjust adjustment to, this, uh, to these percentages can really mean a lot of help to, to four or 500 clubs. Okay, next question is by a former alumni of the FIFA master, uh, Eric Amstein, who agrees with, uh, with what you said about the... Uh, players and agents uh, relation but his, his question is about is about how quickly do you know do you think that club can switch their strategy which is relying on agent within just a couple of months with this with this with this crisis do you think that that clubs are able to really change their way of dealing with uh, uh, with players without yeah. uh, giving so much to agents? We, we, we all function, we all work in, in, in under certain regulations, you know, and, uh, you know, if regulations allow for agents to extract these huge amounts of money, then obviously the agents, you know, are going to go ahead and extract as much as they can. But if the regulations are limiting these, this extraction of valuable financial resources, then uh, they won't be so influential. Okay. Uh, any, any other comment on that one? It's also, yeah, sorry. It's up to FIFA to, to introduce the new, uh, because they introduce now a cap for agents and many other uh, reforms in the transfer market. Of course, all this situation does not favor the, the, the implementation, the quick implementation of it, but I think there is an opportunity also at the same time to reset it now and to start with, uh, for example, a cap for agents or uh, the, the loans, the limiting of loans, etc. I think they should even go further than what they have announced. But already it's a good step made by FIFA with the, with the, um, the money also coming through uh, 
at Chamber, at FIFA, uh, all of these uh, was decided uh, with the stakeholders uh, after a long debate last two years and now it's time to move on, I think, even though, of course, uh, the situation, uh, there are other problems, but uh, I think it's time to act. Yeah, when, when, uh, uh, I, I would like to, to, to finish with one question, which is very simple. Ethically, what is the most needed at the moment? What would you, if you have to, to make one proposal, each of you four, to the various regulators and people who have to deal, one which is based on what you think is the, the one that may help the transfer system to be uh, more efficient and more ethical, which is probably what all five of us and all our uh, viewers and listeners are, 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 are interested in. What should we do? There is one small change that is necessary today. So as much I understood is to, to put a little bit more money in the case of Dennis, am I right? For the, for the, for the general group, not only for the top? No, uh, that's only just a, a part, I think it's just a, a small section of what, what uh, could be done, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any, 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 yeah. any final comment? When, yes. I, I would like also to insist on one aspect about the transfer market. There are a few clubs that are on the stock market and uh, uh, publish the figures of the cost of transfers, of the fees they pay to agents, etc. This transparency should be really a layer to all operations. We need to know more. And this by itself it will be a self-regulating uh, impact because then the funds will see so we need to have more transparency in the accounts uh, of the clubs and specifically in relationships to transfer where there are money laundering there are issues around it and uh, this would be better for football better for the funds for the states for uh, uh, tax, uh, in yes. tax uh, authorities. So I think we, we must go there. And uh, this should be, for me, from an ethical perspective, a very important step. Uh, I, think, I follow you completely. Yeah. Yes. I, I, think, I think in the coming period, I think the bigger clubs, the mega clubs, they will continue to grow because they, have, they are not, 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 no longer orientated towards their uh, local community. I mean, uh, so many clubs are global brands now, and they will continue to grow. And when we when we watch Champions League, of course, we admire the players, we admire the clubs. It's a fantastic competition. It's the best club competition in the world. You know, we feel a sense of pride, even from Lokomotiva, to, to, to watch such a competition. But we feel this pride because we feel this competition belongs to us also it belongs to smaller clubs as well as the bigger clubs so in the future i think it's very important because let's face it eka is not representing uh, 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 you know the, the smaller clubs uh, i think the biggest threat to, to to football club football in the in the coming six months is going to be the survival of smaller clubs i really firmly believe this and i think uh, to avoid drastic, drastically, uh, drastic situations whereby we have maybe 100 or 200 clubs go bankrupt, um, you know, in September or October, I think that it's very important. Even even discussions like this can add to the overall knowledge people have on uh, club clubs' operational mo uh, models, and I think it's very important to open up a period of dialogue for everyone to understand each other better and to understand the needs of, of, of smaller clubs. Um, I would completely also add, agree with you. Yeah. Uh, yes, Piotr. Okay, I would also add that uh, this situation should make us all aware that uh, um, having an academy is very important uh, thing. Uh, this, I think, it's now obvious for, for for a certain number of clubs, but some of them are not uh, happy to to have a strong academy. But now it's uh, we can we can see. And uh, we can understand that uh, it can be a future of, of football. Uh, that having an academy, uh, it's, it's uh, not that much expensive than transferring uh, players from other uh, clubs. And uh, also, if you have your own players, you will survive because these players from your own academy are cheaper and uh, are more connected to the, to the club because you, you can develop them for many years. So they can understand uh, the situation, which is which is uh, tough, 
So there are a lot of opportunities and uh, FIFA and UEFA should now even force clubs to, to, to uh, make academies stronger and uh, even those clubs uh, that are with no academies, they should start doing this. Franco. Yeah, I completely agree with Peter. Uh, I think clubs uh, has to develop and, and invest more in academics because it's the future of the clubs, you know. So I know many clubs in South America are uh, doing that because they realize uh, it's the only way to be successful in terms of economic and also uh, in terms of sport. So uh, this, this pandemic uh, teaches us uh, a lesson that we, uh, as a as a part of this game, uh, we all have to to be involved and to try to 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 help and develop these academics because it's the future of the sport. It's great. Thank you very much to all of you. One one proposal. It's more than a question from just football. We said, well, instead of trying to regulate agents, why not increase solidarity payment levels between clubs to greater incentive use development? That's probably one of the points that, that, that could be discussed. We have no time to, to see that, but thanks for all there. There were so many people asking to participate. Thank you. Thank you to all four of you. Well, and I say, uh, I, I would say the professionalism, the ethical vision and, and focusing a discussion like that, not only on top clubs, but seeing a reality that is a bit more complex. Uh, was was a pleasure for us to, to see. I would like to uh, say uh, uh, that next week we will follow with our next uh, webinar will be on decision making uh, in sport during this crisis and it will be an interesting uh, other part of the of, of the element, one of the few where football will, will not necessarily be essential in the discussion. Well, I would I would like to uh, to, to remember that you can uh, uh, be part of our, our webinar. Thank you for taking question, and uh, I hope all of you you can subscribe to it. And, and all four of you, well done, and many many things. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and bye everybody. Thank you.